Hi, I'm John Shear. Hi, I'm Dan Futterman, and we'll be accompanying you on this journey. Along with Alan Cumming, who'll be coming in later, and Gabe Olds. So here we are at the beginning of the movie, which took a lot of finessing over time to try to establish the right mood and set up all the different approaches that the movie takes to the story. Hear any good stories lately? First up is a story. Charlie, our lead character here, is, is so at the beck and call of his backstory, you know, of, of these flashes of love and loss, that the only control he has is to try to shape these feelings into a story. I swear. It's another example of the universe saying, just when you thought you were safe. Just when you thought you had it. The movie was interesting in that not only were we trying to uh, uh, show what it's like and how it feels to be in this man's head um, without knowing what's happened to him, but knowing that he's in an extreme emotional place, but also the physical production had a lot of different layers in terms of... That just, uh, that's John Shear on the... Uh... <laughs> the left sidewalk <laughs> making one of his two appearances in the movie. Yes. With Made a Put Camera, our, our co producer. John is a shorter one. <laughs> She's an extremely tall woman. Uh, now, what was nice about that was that, uh, and the way again we shot a lot of these things was oh my God, I need two white jackets because we have to harken back to when people see this a second time, they'll realize that there are two people in white jackets it's later on. Uh, and luckily we had them. All of these different locations that you're seeing were found while we were doing location scouting. Uh, Carol Newman, the production designer, and I would make a list of the places that we loved. Um, and those shots of buildings uh, were shot actually by a different cinematographer than our lead cinematographer, a man named Ronnie Dennis, who did a great job. We, we shot all of that. There are more coming up in uh, four hours. We went from Lower Manhattan to Chelsea, across the bridge into Hoboken for that one shot of the bus, this Mondrian building. <laughs> now we're into our first tale. Um, some people believe that that man is Dan Futterman, even though we just saw him across the street. Um, that is my penchant for casting doppelgangers all the way through the movie, which uh, can confound some people and make other people a little happy. And we're all on the same page in the Screen Actors Guild book. <laughs> um, this is Paige Turco and Scott Denny. Um, Paige Turco, uh, it, it amazed me that uh, when she told me the reason she accepted this was because nobody had asked her to play a sexy woman before. Uh, I found that impossible to believe. Um, and tried to take advantage of fulfilling her uh, desire to, uh, to like that shot, to, to come off the way I'm amazed she isn't uh, used all the time. Now, that man, it's the second time we've seen him. Some audiences uh, laugh wildly at that moment because they know something's up and recognize him from that earlier shot. Other people think that we shot for a really low budget and are recycling our extras. Um, you got another one to start all over again. And then there's my favorite. The emerging markets. At this point, some people are aware that it's a folktale. It is uh, something that actually, to a certain extent, happened to my dad, but he didn't get to have sex before it. He went to the hospital and uh, for um, an exploratory, and they had the wrong chart and took out his kidney. I had no idea that it was true. <laughs> for the people who are looking for sexual organs, there's a Where's Waldo there. And uh, I promised him to say that that really was ice in the tub. So for people who are, are right. trying to see how, how well endowed he is, um, he was under duress. And I fear that the audience is under duress at this point as well. And, and I'm sorry about that. This opening with all these different fragments and folktales is the best we could do to crack open Charlie's experience. We tried higher concept with the folktales. We tried taking the folktales out. And it always ended up being that this was the best way. I love this city. Someone's always got it worse than you. I think that's an important line there. 
I got the best direction of the movie at that point was, was Danny, look up. <laughs> you know, again, for the rest of this title sequence, it's a sense of overture, snatches of dialogue and, and, and other scenes, often of which are from scenes that we cut in the film so that we could tell our, distribu our investors that we had been uh, efficient with their money. Uh, but a sense of a world that is just as shaped by love and loss as his interior world, that the exterior is, an, is a match to his interior. You know, I heard the story about this friend of a friend of mine. I know this one. Remember the 50s? There's the most underused actor in America, Lothar Bluto. When we asked him to do the movie, uh, he grilled me for an hour and a half on the phone. There are very few actors in this that um, were auditioned, but Lothar uh, just called me up and grilled me for an hour and a half, and it had nothing to do with his character, really. He just asked me about the piece itself for a very long time to make sure that it was something that uh, he would be uh, proud to be a part of. And I really appreciate that. This happened. Uh -huh. What if I finally found a thing I can't get through? Wouldn't that suck? <laughs> These credits, I think, are kind of neat. Um, they were done digitally. Um, we had done a process that you'll see a, a featurette as another uh, extra on this uh, that'll go more into detail about. And so because they were done digitally, they were able to appear behind actors and go behind uh, buildings. A man named uh, Ken Brady designed them and, and, and I think did a, a really wonderful job. That's my way of keeping shit from happening to me. The challenge here, I think, is that you have a character who's stuck. You know, it's, it's lots of antic movement and, and, and feeling and emotion, but he cannot move forward because of everything that's happened to him that we're seeing dribs and drabs of. And uh, soon he will meet the character who will allow him to move forward, a character from the past. And so the, the, ch the challenge is to keep you in the movie while being true to his experience. And there are a lot of shots in this movie like that. Here, Carol has uh, How to Survive on a Sweatshirt, which I think is kind of nice. Uh, but there are lots of shots that split him in half, or here, the frame is pretty much split in half. We're aware of, of an absence. I was going out when everyone was coming in. And today, I felt like I was going back in time to you. The first of the many dodges about whether Chris is alive or not if you're watching it for the second time. <laughs> we sincerely hope you are, because we're going to give everything away. What's been interesting about this is we've done a lot of Q&As after the movie, and, and uh, these phone calls come up a lot. And women always know the answers. Like, a man will ask the question in terms of who's he speaking to, and I'll just look at a woman who looks like she's ready to... <laughs> sort of bursting with the answer, and, and you know, he's, he's calling his own machine that still has Chris on the, on the message. John oh. Shear once again. <laughs> it's unfortunate that we, uh, this is the first take, this is the second take, the first take of that, nobody knew it was going to be me, uh, and uh, they just <laughs> thought it was funny. The cameraman thought I was making fun, and so you just saw the camera shaking up and down, but I just wanted to surprise people. Um, I wanted some visual evidence of what it looks like to, uh, to be as tired as a human can possibly be. You're never given anything you can't handle. Bullshit. Another important series of lines, I think, uh, for that character. Nice Saturday Night Fever. <laughs> In addition to popular legends, there are sort of urban folklore-ish things. And when I was a kid, I was really fascinated by those uh, doors into cellars on the street and really wondered whether people would fall in or dogs would fall in as they were walking by if they weren't paying attention. I'm just trying to get home, really. You know, I stopped in some fucking place over there to get a brewski. No, 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 really, you know? And uh, I, I got to take a leak. I go in there and I assume the position, right? I got my hands full, right? And some Sam Ball. Sam Ball was the only lead actor in this to audition. Um, and we're really lucky that uh, we did that. He got a SAG card doing this, and he's amazing. And that was the first thing he shot. A technical thing here, Danny, during his close-ups, is in 18 frames per second, which is six frames uh, faster, so he's a little fast motion, and Sam Ball and his girlfriend are shot a little slow motion, 30 frames per second. That was David Weir, who is... <laughs> Um, does a great job making an impression very quickly because as with almost everybody in the movie um, even if they have a small part he will reappear I 
and the first time through watching this, you were thinking, what the hell is his problem? <laughs> and now, second time, you know? And again, I think uh, you're dealing with the other side of the bed. Uh, you know, that pillow there. You, know. <laughs> you remember, this is the most horrendous sequence to shot, <laughs> looking, <laughs> looking through this, these blinds. John was on a fire escape across the way, telling me, on your tiptoes, down, <laughs> oh, I can see your eyes, <laughs> yelling through somebody else. Now, this is a shot, a man named Pete Consul, who was the... Savior. Just an amazing cinematographer and helped uh, supervise the, the digital process that we did later. This sequence, everything that takes place in Charlie's bedroom was actually a reshoot. Uh, now, here, that was that's actually done with a zoom out and just that obliteration of, of Dan right there is an improv that Pete's doing that is just so in line with the, the needs of the movie. That shot is one of only two shots that is a direct uh, steal from another movie <laughs> besides Saturday Night Fever. That's uh, from Apocalypse Now. Uh, I figured uh, I had to do that in order to be a filmmaker. It's, it's uh, give somebody else's stuff. One of the reasons why we reshot everything in the apartment was that the first apartment we had um, was the worst shooting day we had, um, a real nightmare. Uh, and the place was very small and dingy, and the bed was very small. Uh, and there is a, a lot about, you know, sort of going back home in this and getting back in that bed and being able to sleep. And uh, you, it needs to be a fairly welcoming place. And uh, the first place was actually, we discovered after we'd been there, um, that it was a brothel uh, that had just been closed down, that a friend of Stephanie Golden, our amazing producer, um, uh, he lived there. And we were kicked out uh, pretty much near the end of our shooting day because his, uh, his girlfriend uh, was trying to get back at him. What do you want from me? I want you to know. There are lines in that horror movie that apply to the rest of the movie in terms of I want you to know you're mine. It's actually repeated a lot. Um, now, it was interesting shooting this scene. It was hard enough to shoot it the first time, but uh, for Danny, I think uh, this was not a fun day. Do you remember what you uh, you said when we uh, when we set up where you asked to see the monitor, yep. you, and uh, you then sort of saw the frame, and, and and you went, I can't believe my mother is going to see this. <laughs> <laughs> she couldn't believe it either. Uh, she she did, she did. I think uh, my father was more disturbed than my mother, as it turned out. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's Gabe Bowles, by the way. He's now joined us. We've gotten a lot of comment about that scene. Some people uh, have found it really personal and moving. Other people have found it uh, uh, really disturbing. There was a guy who ran out of the theater and I introduced myself and asked him what the problem was. He said, well, I, I, I know I, I do it and I've just never seen it where it hasn't been funny and I guess I look like that. And he was just freaked out by it and I, I, I like that. <laughs> this is Charlie's aborted attempt at calling the police. He, we had included a, a call to the police at the end of the movie, which we cut after he no. um, tears the poster down. No, uh, his difficulties with the police are rooted in what we hear in the horror movie, where she says, I'm going to call the police, and the horror guy says, they don't care. That scene was shot in maybe 15 seconds. We, we were told that we had to flee the building and literally did the entire thing and set up in, in, in around 10 minutes. That's low tear again. If you get lucky, good night for it. Daylight saving time ends tonight. You, you get w one hour twice. There's an introduction of uh, daylight savings time. Yeah. I, I it's one of my favorite things. It, it, it obsessed me when I was a kid, that idea of which hour we do sec, you know, twice. I always like looking in the TV times to see how they deal with it. Uh, and no movie had ever dealt with it. And it felt like this was a movie very much about uh, trying to get back what's taken from you. Um, and it felt appropriate. My mother, I, you ever hear the one? I, I this is lady. one of my favorite uses of the urban legends where you see it happening behind him, what he's talking about, possibly from his head. I think this is a way in which it works pretty seamlessly in the movie. And also later on where Josh Hamilton, you'll see, talks about uh, something that happened to him, and then you see it happen as well. Also, if you watch carefully at the end of the movie, when I come back and meet up with him, is an entirely different location for the front of the building. <laughs> yeah, we shot it without any close-ups. Uh, we were, I was 
trying to do as much and master as possible. And uh, we also had no time. <laughs> and uh, and it, it's a big scene at the end, so we went in for coverage. I had a whole bag of fresh runs on the classic Hoagie Rolls and, and some Kellogg's lightly pressed and brand flesh. <laughs> <laughs> It was interesting because uh, Lothar was uh, concerned about his accent and what people would think. And, and it's like, I, I don't think anybody, he's just such an odd character that you don't worry about that. Don't forget to, to set your clock back. So there is sort of the first time that we actually see Charlie notice somebody that seems to be out of a folktale. And that is the entry to this street. We've seen the street once before when he stares down it, and now he starts walking down it. As the movie progresses, he'll go farther and farther each time. This is an introduction of, of a character that appears often as you have seen if you've watched the movie, and he's inspired by The Vanishing Hitchhiker, which is a tale. Also, there is something there that was uh, discovered. A, a lot of the movie, the reason why we spent a lot of time in the beginning is to try to make it as seamless as possible since so many different strands are being introduced without really anything to guide you. We don't know this man's name. We don't know, you know, we've watched him masturbate without really knowing any details about his life. We've sort of seen him in extremis uh, and, and don't have the things, the meat cutes that you usually have in movies. This karma bar. Uh, was not put up by a set direction. It actually <laughs> used to exist on West 4th Street. It is now closed shortly after making the movie. How you doing this evening? Something I can get you? That's Josh Hamilton. Forgetting about you at least twice a day. Hey, come on. Why would I hate you? I hardly know you. Most of these asides, like, why should I hate you, I hardly know you, actually resonate with the entire someone? movie. I'm gonna wait. Please. In any movie, I think you want Anytime everything to be something? pertinent, but especially in this movie, every something. piece of dialogue that's overheard from an extra, all the walla, everything on the TV, the horror movies and soap operas, the, the lyrics and songs, um, the, the way that we cut uh, to the music and the music is cut to the editing rhythms, all create a hermetically sealed universe, which helps us feel like we are in someone's head. So th that folk tale aspect of, is this real or isn't it? Is this in Charlie's head or is this subjective? Is this subjective or is it objective reality? Um, is all helped by things like that aside. If we're taking up space. You waiting? Yeah. For this, um, this guy. Something happened and, uh, you don't want to hear this. Sorry. No, this isn't that kind of bar, and from the looks of things, you're not that kind of bartender. That kind? Ah. This is uh, the reveal of the sexuality of our lead character around 20 minutes into the movie. Um, and uh, one of the things that we're dealing with here is what difference does it make? This character, Josh's character, Matt, says it doesn't make any difference to him. Um, doesn't make a difference to the people watching the movie. Do we now change our idea of who Charlie is? We've identified with him perhaps a bit sexually, thinking of, of who he might be talking to, and does that change the way we see him? Does it change the way we see the movie? Or do we now feel like, oh, wow, we, you know, I'm watching a gay film, if you haven't heard about the movie? And how does that change things? Her name was Clara. Early 40s, beautiful. Lover of jazz and bourbon There's salad. a trick there. It's the, one of the only tricks in the movie, but uh, that was a wipe. Um, that's a different actor. And there's Josh again, as Danny was talking about, in terms of different strategies for each tale. This one, we're mixing past and present yeah, all in one space. That's Barbara Sokova, one of the greatest actresses alive. Um, the sexiest mother of three children mm. in the world. Married to uh, the artist Robert Longo. 
who affected the scene, actually. There, there are only two places in the movie that I can remember where there are improvs uh, and where things changed fundamentally because of an actor. And uh, here, with this, she said that her husband was uh, confused because her story doesn't really end in a folktale way, the way it was originally done, which is that her plane didn't blow up. It was just about her paying him to unzip. And Barbara had done a reading of the screenplay with Danny um, in New York. It was one of my ways to with Danny, even though I wanted to make an offer, Danny had been brought up to me by our casting director, um, Jordan Beswick, and I had uh, shared a part with him in a play where I had done it in L.A. and he'd done it in New York and had seen him in a lot of things, but couldn't quite make an offer with I didn't want to audition him, but uh, uh, felt that a good way would be to just uh, work with him by doing a reading, getting to hear the whole thing and, and seeing whether he liked working with me and I liked working with him. This is the first I've heard of this. I thought I was doing him a favor. <laughs> <laughs> and you were. Shut up. It's true. God. We had, to, we had to cut that just because it was slowing things down, but she kept staring in her take. It went on for a long time, and it was really kind of amazing. <laughs> I get an immediate bone, I must admit. And then she puts a crisp 50 down on the bar. For you. Well, I haven't done anything to deserve that. Not yet. I'm sorry, I, we're supposed to keep talking, but I'm just stunned every time she... I, 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 I think she's an amazing woman. Oh, so anyway, she... Uh, <laughs> um, so she's just done the first actor improv, which is uh, the thing where she was talking about the remote control. That's hers. Uh, and you can't tell Barbara Sokova that... Uh, sorry, but, uh, you know, there's no improv in my movie, but uh, it was great. <laughs> Why were you... Were, were you against... I'm sorry. I don't actually remember no. that. One of the things is that there's a rhythm to this movie, that the movie's constantly dealing, you know, with uh, pushing a certain type of stylization. And there's a thin line, as with folktales, about is it true or isn't it? With this movie, there's sort of a thin line between the, the surrealism of it and sort of a naturalism. There's very little that's sort of loosey-goosey, and improvs usually feel a bit loosey-goosey. Here's interesting, John, you can't tell, I was just thinking, who shot this, which who, who was Shane, yeah. um, first DP. And, Shane uh, Kelly. And you can't tell who shot what. They're both sort of equally great. Yeah, I mean, we were really fortunate with, you know, with that situation. Um, and also working in digital, uh, we were able it's to sort of fine tune the, the matching of, of color. But this whole scene is, is from, uh, is Shane's. One of the things uh, Gabe sort of brought up color, and, and, and what I guess we can talk about now is that every sequence had its color. Uh, it's why Gabe, uh, Gabe's sort of wearing Superman underwear later on, because his, his <laughs> color was blue. Uh, even his drink is blue. And almost every sequence uh, has a color that's predominant. And, um, in this one, the, the past scene is very yellow. He has, he's, the bar sort of um, glows a bit yellow. The, the bathroom is yellow. His shirt in the past is yellow. The spigot. Um, is yellow. Uh, the production designer, uh, everybody, the costume designer, the production designer, um, working under severe limitations budgetarily. The, the budget was $5,000 for each department, and that was for materials and salaries. And uh, yet they were able to repaint. Uh, almost every set is repainted so that things will match that idea of, of sequences being um, attached to certain colors. Whatever David Metwico could get Banana Republic to take back, he could keep as a salary. <laughs> Yeah, that's 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 the costume designer's jacket, by the way. Um, it was uh, the unfortunate thing of uh, I think this is why costume designers don't invite you to their house while you're having your big discussion of what you want. It's like, oh, that's perfect. That's exactly what I have in mind. Um, it's for your help, <laughs> Dick. This guy, he um, he's someone you might remember seeing here before. Okay, what does he look like? Well. He was born with all the right stuff. Good looking, huh? Yeah. Now this right. is the big MacGuffin here. He says that, uh, you know, he's looking for this guy and the implication is that it's that one night, that fateful night, I mean, is, is you know, sort of because he has a, a dark crush. And we discover that it's not quite that as things go along. Even though a lot of people who see the movie, or some people who see the movie feel that there is a mix of you know, that it's, it's a lust for revenge and a lust for, for him at the same time, that they're a little mixed in there. It's not. Any particular days, times? Nah. Wait. Okay. I'll see you later then. All right? 
You sure is what you're looking for? Yeah. Don't worry, I got everything under control. Hey, what do you wanna do? Do you wanna do? We should talk about music a bit. There's a lot of music in this movie. The original music is written by Mark Anthony Thompson, who has a band called Chocolate Genius, um, which is basically him. And the way we used him, uh, or asked him to do this, uh, was he, he, he'd scored one other movie, not, uh, which, which was a little simpler than this. But um, I really wanted the source music, all the things that happened in the band. Oh, I should stop myself. That is uh, the reappearance of the kidney victim. Um, which again should prove to everybody that uh, Dan Futterman was not the man whose kidney was taken. That scene is with a lot of those little urban folklore things or things that uh, happened when I was living in uh, New York in one summer in particular. And I was living in Chelsea and I had a crossed wire. Every time I picked up the phone, there was a man with um, a Spanish accent who, who said, it's not my fault, it's not my fault. Every time, he was always there on the phone and he was talking not about having killed somebody, but the fact that this crossed wire. So I, I left and went to West 23rd Street and it was raining and I was under an awning and somebody came and urinated on one side, then a well-dressed man on the other side and I moved to LA two days later. <laughs> so this is a different way of getting into the past. Alan Cummings. And this would be me. <laughs> that would be me as well. That would be me, not well. <laughs> you know, one, one of the things that's happening in the movie is that you hear that a lead character is gay, and then, you know, a couple of minutes later, you have the sort of typical gay film for a little while, sort of the myth of... of yeah, a happy gay person at party, then dying is, is person. Hey. Oh, you're wet. Oh. Flawless American accent. Oh, bless you. <laughs> we did this like in the same day though, didn't we? Like the party. Oh yeah. That morning and then. What was nice was that it took so long for the drag artist to get ready that we were able to sort of rehearse the rest of the day. Yeah. <laughs> so here is, you know, we've, we, we know that, that our lead character has been pining for somebody and now we finally get to meet him. And there's a mirror shot. There are a number of them in the movie. Pretty much every American text has Alice in Wonderland, Andor, The Wizard of Oz, Andor, Huck Finn, and we've got the first two. Yeah. <laughs> Dan uh, claims that he's a, a terrible singer, so as this comes up, um, I've forced us to include. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this is hilarious. Yes. Have your dick and eat it too. <laughs> and the shark's pretty fabulous to do that. Just catch it. <laughs> <laughs> this is a skeleton key song. It's a great New York band. We shoot. Oh, was it? Oh, yeah. This is such a great bit. Those that bit in the window. I love that. And that's Matt that? Kiesler. Um, in New York, where, where they are, down there. <clears throat> um, your apartment is on Houston Street. It was yeah. actually the real apartment of, of our storyboard artist. Oh, is it the storyboard <laughs> artist? <laughs> we, nobody got away unscathed. This is a very Hitchcockian angle here, John. That's true. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> every, every, actually, every sequence, there is a certain thing that happens in every sequence. One is that somebody reaches out for another character in every scene, and there's also a shot, a sort of skewed shot from above, which has its answer at the end of the movie when you realize mm -hmm. where Chris actually lives. And there's also the killing of a bug in every scene. <laughs> it took us half an hour to find a cockroach in New York City, <laughs> and there was a restaurant downstairs. This is a fake in that that's actually an office building, and that is the bathroom of an office building that is her oh, kitchen. Shit. Yeah, we were, she wasn't there, was she, when we did that? Year? No. <laughs> Mary Louise Burke, wonderful actress. You know, what, um, remember there was a little trailer a long time ago, and I, I, uh, my favourite line that I said in the whole film was on it, and it was cut. Which is when I hold up a condom and go, do you want to fuck? It's in, it's, we're, we're putting it in the, uh, the deleted scenes. Oh, are we? In yeah, this, in this I, DVD? Yeah. So if you scoot along later, you'll see that. <laughs> yeah, but go forward. This is boring. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, don't be. I am. Oh. That's just the old girl next door's microwave. What? She's nuts. 
So. One of the nice things about the movie is that even though we shot it, we shot most of it in, in an 18 day stretch, um, we were able to move fast yeah, enough that we were able to I do our own reshoots while we were shooting. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so green is the color of the sequence. It's sort of, you know, mm. it's a color that is both happy when it's sort of natural, vibrant green, and sickly. And so we go from, in this sequence now, he's gone to sickly green for his pajamas. I love them talking about Glenda Jackson. <laughs> She's like a member of parliament now in Britain and was nearly, nearly the London mayor. Wow. Um, last night was Sunday, Bloody Sunday. Did you ever see One Sunday? of the things that I learned about this movie is, is you can tell a good performance by how many stills you can get out of, uh, out of the film. All the stills in the movie are from the actual film. And you're amazing, this Alan. Was, and, this photo was everywhere, wasn't it? Me yeah. and Dan in the mirror. But it's, it's you, one of the ways that I edited the movie was that I would turn this, uh, I would go through one pass. Continuity here. <laughs> <laughs> this was the first day, and we actually crossed the line there. Um, but, uh, um, uh, what was I saying? Yeah, uh, saying how fabulous I was. I can't remember why. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> that, that I would go through the movie when I was editing and, t and just turn the sound down and just watch without being able to listen. And you're it's like a silent movie performance to me. I Gosh, you know, that's so funny. I want to make a silent movie, John. Well, you, and, you, you, and you know Robert Rodriguez? Yeah. I yeah. did this film with him, and he said as well that I should make a silent film. And I, and I actually had thought it would be so nice now to make a film that, that's not really just... You know, not like with tinkly music underneath it, but just that no one talks in it, and you understand the story by, by watching people's faces. That'd be yeah. fantastic. And mm. I know that you'll be great from having done this. <laughs> Literally, I mean, there's just countless stills that we have. I mean, just everything you do, it's it's, it's part of sort of focus from actors. Whoa! Look at him. <laughs> oh. Matt is really gorgeous, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> Sickening. This is a sweet sequence. Yeah, it is nice. One of the things that almost all the flashbacks oh, yeah. with you guys are in one. It's like a very cutty movie, and the flashbacks just sort of let it happen. Calm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now you're protected. Listen. Oh, that's the photo that was everywhere. I'm here for you. Of course you are. You're not here for you. There's a this cut a coming up here. Who'd you kill, Charlie? One of the only cuts that, that we did in terms of taking a chunk out of a scene. Not it was actually my one of my favorite things in the movie. Uh, what was it again? Your condom line. Your condom. Oh, my you, condom line. Oh, that's right. I, yeah. When you I go to the window, to, you I go, go to the window. To, yeah, you go to the window, oh, and I, I come and say, "I want." Will you have sex? Still in mourning, huh? There's something I say to do with rim, isn't there? Coming up, so it's always a huge <laughs> reaction. <laughs> Well, it's, a lot of this movie is in code, you know, yeah, there are different, yeah. again, we were talking before about okay. myths that people oh, yeah. have about each other, and that's a line, it's, it's coming me. up, and well, when we were in Salt Lake City, when we when we premiered at Sundance, and then they give you one regular screening in Salt Lake City, and it was all these Mormons, and we were sure we were dead, and we'd actually invited distributors who felt that they weren't quite, they, the distributors all liked it, but they didn't know who else would, and we said, <laughs> well, you know, if there's ever going to be an audience that's not going to get this movie, it's in Salt Lake City, let's see what happens, and it was an audience filled with 20-year-old blonde straight couples. It was like Village of the Damned grown up. Um, it was, <laughs> How was it? It was a smash. Ah, uh, you see? Uh, but what was interesting was that this line that comes up, which is one of the lines in code for that audience, there were two people that laughed. It was like, okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> and it's that way all the way through the movies, like, you know, in Seattle where people let, knew the folktales. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they were really into the folktales in Seattle and started talking back to the screen. Each audience sort of deals with the movie in a different way. And one of the best screenings we ever had was our first screening in New York. It was a 900-seat house, and the audience was just every type of category that the movie would appeal to. And it was just like a roller coaster. Different people in the audience carrying it in different ways. And didn't have the guts. Oh, poor Charlie. No. Not anymore. Oh, here it comes. Not this time. I just went back. Here we go. And he wasn't in yet. So I came ah. here. Four, three, two, one. In the inter rim. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> oh, pause for laughter. Uh, again, the movie sort of has been commented on by a lot of people in terms of the number of cuts. There are like more cuts in the movie than the birds. <laughs> but 
the rest of the scene plays out in, in one done, shot. You would be glad if you saw him. You guys are just... And what a shot it is. <laughs> oh, well, good luck, honey. You know I wish the best for you. I wouldn't cut away with you, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> There's no need sometimes. I hate this. I, I was amazed you did this. The last draft of the script was written for particular actors, and, and the no. last draft of the script was written for you, Alan, for this See, I'm blind and I was told by everybody we would never, ever have a chance of getting you. You so were in right. Rome doing Titus. I and know, you... I was so tired. Remember, and, you know, it and, and, <laughs> and you were rehearsing with Joel Grey. Oh, my God, yeah, I was doing that thing with the Joel. president. <laughs> and I was doing, doing cabaret every night in, on Broadway, yeah. yeah. Was, but it was Paul, my agent, who just loved this Tourism script so job. much and said, you'll love this. And I did, and that's why I did it. Well, thank God for him, because a number of agencies wouldn't let... There was one actor that we asked to play Dean, Dean and he was right told by his agency that if he did it, they would have to reconsider his place at the agency. Oh, God sake. I thought that he was told that if he did it, he'd be worse than Sam Ball. <laughs> and he would have been. There's nobody <laughs> better than Sam. I'll stay for a little while. Let's watch Women in Love. No... I'm going to lie here and tell myself stories about you in the cold night looking for your man. Don't worry. That's another little joke. In my version, you'll always come out on top. Hearing your voice on the message doesn't cut it I've anymore. Gonna, yeah. I need you to talk to Bye. me. Bye, everybody. I finally figured out. This was a what drag that we had to reshoot this because it was really Please good the first pick time. Up. You'll Look, get it on your uh, second, uh, deleted okay. scenes. This is actually a mix of the first time we shot it and the second time we shot it. Just it what? seemed the first time that we did it that he was being interrupted by somebody on the other I side. Of the and because we were not sure whether people were going to buy the real leap that the yeah, movie no, takes in terms of the fact that a character that we've been watching is actually dead. We allowed it for a while, and then when we really uh, decided that, that it was, we needed to make it clear that he was dead, we needed to make sure that this take was like the others in terms of not being interrupted by somebody since the person's dead. He's just calling his machine. Uh, five. Hey, Charlie. Man. There's Gables. Blue yes. drink? Yes. Thanks. Blue teeth. Patient, my friend. Now, the song that's playing, to go back to God music, is patient. by Chocolate Genius. And since I, I wanted the source music in the movie to fit in with the rest of the movie, well, usually the lyrics have to do with good. things that are happening in the movie, we decided that every time Charlie goes into the bar, it's playing a Chocolate Genius song, and, and went to Chocolate Genius and asked him to write the rest of the music, because uh, I just think his stuff is great. And so he did all the original composition. Sexuality-wise, I think that this is an important scene because this uh, pickup is, becomes sort of a mutual pickup uh, where there's trade-off between Charlie and Matt, the bartender, uh, sort of mutual understanding of what's happening, straight guy and a gay guy. Yeah, I mean, a lot that character, um, you know, Matt is always trying to prove that he's, you know, he's he's jiggy with that, and uh, <laughs> um, hence the kick was... him out of my butt. Yeah, which uh, which I. Uh, I'm egotistical enough to say that I'm proud that, that people have repeated that line back to me at parties. Uh, but what, what this scene is dealing with is what a lot of the scenes are dealing with, which is, uh, you know, treading between myths and realities of, in this instance, gay life. And in the Brett scene, the myth of the dying friend, but the reality and the, 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 what we're also trying to show are things that you don't often see. Uh, the the sexuality mixed with friendship of a lot of gay relationships. Here it's cruising, dealing with some of the myths of cruising and some of the realities that audiences may not know about that you don't usually see. In almost every scene, there is a stereotype, uh, you know, the, the yuppie, the, the bartender who's seen it all and has no judgments, and Charlie pushes it a bit and lets them... Uh, drop their mask and, and see what's underneath, what's which is much more human. The contact lens stuff, the toothbrush is still there. Okay, so Gary asked me, what do What I was do? fun about oh, this when we were in Seattle uh, at the first screening, the audience was so cued into the urban legend aspect of the movie that when we got to this, somebody right around here just yelled out toothbrushes. Right, right. Um, and 
before she says it. And uh, the rest of the audience sort of laughs and, and whispers amongst themselves to figure out if they know the story. And uh, I loved that. This story is interesting in terms of how people agreed to actually do that because that really, that toothbrush is really where it looks yeah. like it is. It was set up for one shoot and wow. the people, we told them what it was going to be and they did not show up. Really um, so Stephanie, our producer, was trying to find other people and these two guys who were in those so photos were uh, came by while we were shooting something else on the street and they said, we're extras, we're extras in the movie. And uh, uh, he said, <laughs> so, really? So he said, really? Okay. And uh, uh, our second second sort of said, this is what we need. And they were completely into it and uh, showed up and didn't actually had ideas. A lot of that setup of stuff in the, in the mirror was their idea. And uh, um, it, those pictures were shot by our producer. Now, that woman who just walked by actually manages this building, and it was the way that we got it. It's we, a great location on Christopher Street, as you'll see in just a second. Yes. One of the exciting things is that we got to shoot pretty much everywhere that I imagined while writing, mm -hmm. we got to shoot where that was. And I had never noticed this building. I knew that the movie sort of continues moving west if you know New York. A lot of people don't know this is New York because it's sort of an urban legend version of New York. There's no mm -hmm. telltale sign except one less than a second shot of the back of the Statue of Liberty later on. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we needed to, we lost another location for an interior and we needed to shoot this on that day, the exterior of your place. So we woke that woman up at one o'clock in the morning because uh, we noticed it at around one o'clock and waited for somebody to come in and they told us where she was and we spoke to her and she was concerned uh, about what the material would be inside and said, is there any deviance in this movie? Oh, really? <laughs> and she said, I know where I live, but I have to, you know, I have to protect the, the place. And uh, that's when we pulled out the card of, you know, we really need somebody in this scene to open the door. <laughs> and uh, she was very gracious. These arms are made to I will admit here that the terrible dialogue that is happening on that soap opera um, <laughs> is actually from a, a draft of one of the phone calls. And who yeah. is the actress facing away? Uh, that is our producer, Stephanie Stay. Goldman. Yeah. Her third Why appearance. Trying to get me off. Huh. I will protect you to the end of my days. You don't give a shit. Gabriel, I can't tell you how many people have asked me if you're well cast in this part. That's cool. <laughs> and I don't know how to answer that. Notice Carol Newman's brilliant set design in this with the huge sort of shady pictures of of Gabriel's <laughs> character, Ron, on the wall. This is 8 by 10. And <laughs> this was all in a big loft, and we basically could shoot two directions, right? I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't come around, really. No. Um, the, this is a humongous, humongous room. Uh, and so we're, we're just shooting um, straight forward and to the side. This is the loft uh, that was shared by the costume designer. <laughs> now, this is... Uh, this idea of the wrong side of the bed, um, I go you, go under. you know, and my side of the bed, the sense of uh, comes that? into play at the end in terms Move. of when, when the character finally Move. rolls onto that side, and we've noticed the emptiness on that side when he's Move. been lying on to one side of the bed. Scared of waking up on the wrong side of the bed. And again, we're playing with myth, uh, the big love, the idealistic love, and, and a casualness. They're talking about the other side of the bed. It's not big moments ever between them. Another myth that's broken here is that gay men don't have hairy chests. The first cut of this movie from this point to the end of the scene was all in one take because you guys were so amazing and Shane did a great job of resizing mm. and zooming in and uh, we held on to it for a really long time but uh, ultimately needed to, to start cutting because uh, the content of the, of the scene was so disquieting for a lot of people that when this, the camera didn't move it, it, it right. just seemed to be too much. How'd you get that? Barbara. Mm -hmm. That's his blue shirt, the, the blue on the I wall. Even the 8 by 10s are sort of tinted blue, but Carol, you know, the fact the that she's in his eyes. Dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll shut up about the colors. <laughs> yeah. 
Something about those eyes. And that. We can talk about sound here. Uh, the men who design the sound, sound designers sort of don't get much uh, credit in movies. I'm actually, literally, I'm amazed that they're usually in the scroll after the transportation department. What's unfortunate is that because of the way that post-production monies are, are spent, it, you usually have to speed through it. Mm -hmm. There, There is a palette of, uh, of sounds in this movie that are repeated a lot. The The rolling bottle on the bottle break, we've heard from the very beginning, a busy signal. He has won a couple of Academy Awards, and as we did with you guys in terms of just going to the people that, you know, we felt were best and hoping that you guys would say yes, um, we did the same with him. It, there was a little bit of a tussle that we had because he, he felt that the editing was very slick in the movie, so we wanted slick sound, and I really wanted to use found sounds and the sounds that we had built from actual production in terms of the bottles. Um, and uh, we came up with a compromise. Now here, the rest of this scene, once you've come down, is all in one shot. Totally mm. gay. Excuse me? And the well, my friends, my purpose uh, of it being in one shot is, again, as happens often in these, in, in almost, in many of the scenes, the last shot is the longest because Charlie's attained a certain control over his emotions and the situation that he hadn't had at the start. He's learning more and more how to get control over other people and situations. Editing was so much fun in terms of trying to use editing patterns to illustrate Charlie's point of view, his frame of mind. You can't help yourself, right? Even though I, I didn't go to school and this is my first film, there was something I picked up from Sam Fuller. I, I read in an interview where he said that every shot is a sentence. And for this movie, it was fun to figure out what the sentence is, what we were trying to get across, and work with the editors to establish a pattern that would demonstrate that. And they were incredibly patient with me, and, and, and I, I owe so much to Randy and Ed, both while we were putting the movie together and afterwards. The, the editor's work is never done. While you're showing the movie, they're making sure everything's going well. They, they, they treated me very well and had great patience and taught me a lot. Come on, let's fuck. I th it's one of my favorite sequences in the movie, though. I think it works for whatever reason that you, you expect things to work well or not to work well. That sequence yeah. in Ron's apartment, I think, works perfectly. Well, the whole push me, pull you on top, on bottom thing, and that just rocks. Yeah, I mean, it's one of good the good drama. And it's also a, a, a sort of a, a side of homosexuality that you don't just don't yeah, normally exactly. see. And also it's there's sort of this technical discussion that's about to happen about <laughs> people have a lot of questions about. Again, you talk about, you know, who's on top, that becomes literal here, but that's something that's all the way through the movie. The phrase is exactly. used a lot. The story in terms of the toothbrushes, you know, a lot of the folktales in this are used okay, as okay. A, to a certain extent the, the subtext for the scene. And and this fear of penetration yeah. is fun. true in a okay. lot of folktales. It's just I don't allow it. What was uh, particularly difficult was that, really? Danny, you were really allergic Shit. in that room yeah, because that's all of the cat. Oh, right, not, yeah. not, not to Gabe. <laughs> <laughs> and we were trying to get through, and, and we'd been doing the rolling around a lot, and we were finally into close-ups, and then after the first take, Gabe, you stopped the take and said, uh, do you remember? No, what did I say? <laughs> you said, I'm really sorry, I can't quite concentrate. Danny, can you roll around with me again? <laughs> 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 I don't remember that at yeah, all. Yes, so that, that was really endearing. Yeah, you're actually, I think, the exact quote was, can you put your hands in my pants? <laughs> <laughs> it's certainly, uh, you don't have to act much when you got something. This is going to work. <laughs> well, actually, one of the things that we were doing, I think, which, I, and I'm really, you know, grateful that you guys went along with this, and everybody did, was that usually sex in movies takes you out. You either notice the corners that are being cut, you know, that people aren't really doing it, or if it's too much, you sort of start dealing with the mechanics, and we were trying to find a good balance. It's the same thing well, with I the mean, gay subject matter of the yeah, movie as well. We tried to approach it as honestly as possible and didn't try to throw it in anybody's face, didn't try to make a statement about it or feel that we were being righteous. Simply shoot it the way 
we think it is. We shot the sexuality in the same way. We included moments that the actors could do and could reasonably do with each other. Um, if their hands are in, supposed to be in certain places, their hands are in those places, uh, holding whatever they're supposed to be holding. And that allows me to stay in the movie. Maybe he takes offense at something. You say We did a reshoot in here um, because of... Uh, the light, basically, um, that uh, it was shot very darkly. And this is an important moment because it's the first time in the movie that Charlie really takes uh, a stand. It's really, yeah, it's really strong. And we needed to see him a little closer. And it's weird also because you don't really know who you root for. Like, Ron is totally an asshole. But at the same time, Charlie's so strong. Yeah, these lines here are repeats from the bashing action. We're back to riffing. But your shot, we that we didn't use of the reshoot is the only setup that we didn't that isn't in the movie. Huh. That's Dean's car, by the way. We saw it outside, and that's what Charlie has. You know, Charlie now finally is making some progress. He, the world is rewarding him for some bad behavior. One of the things about the movie that happens is that what difference do certain things make? What difference does Charlie being gay make to your being able to identify with him? Mm -hmm. What difference now does the fact that he just did the type of thing that your hero doesn't usually do is another sort of complicated relationship that an audience may have with him depending upon who they are. That is taken from a moment that actually happened in front of... Uh, this movie's based on a play called Durban Folk Tales, and I played Charlie, and I was standing in front of that theater, and somebody drove by and threw a bottle at the theater because it, uh, <laughs> it was clear from the picture outside that there was some gay activity. Um, you suck. Uh, was, they, they were not able to come up with a double entendre for that. These people are his upstairs neighbors, and they're played by Megan Dodd and Bill Sage. Bill was somebody that I had in mind while writing the last draft um, from having seen him in mm. Hal Hartley's movies. Um, yeah, that's right. He's all yeah. Megan and I met the day that we were shooting this. Uh, as with most of the other parts, there were offers. I'd seen Megan in, in a couple of things, and the actress who was supposed to do it, who had originally been cast, uh, um, couldn't do it. And she didn't even, you know, with everybody else, we did, you know, an afternoon of rehearsals. And she just showed up and was brilliant from the get-go. John, I think you should talk about the fact that this uh, this editing of this whole sequence of the movie was under much discussion as to whether it was necessary or not. I mean, I love these couple scenes, and I think it's an important part of the movie, but there were those people that thought oh, yeah? it doesn't add to Come the up. story, and you got to get it out. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. The play, um, written by Daniel Wright, was a different beast, but it was seven scenes and, and uh, folktales were mentioned but did not come to life. But the, the sense of a plot of a character who is trying to get something back was really not there. And these two scenes back to back are much closer to the play. And you've established a lead character who was looking for a guy. And now suddenly you have these scenes where he's not looking for him anymore. And they develop more theme than they do plot. But they also develop Charlie's character, which is I essential. Agree. I mean, the, the, oh, they're yeah. the first, the, he becomes a protagonist in these two scenes. Completely. And one of the ways that I tried to make them seem more necessary was in doing that, that mm -hmm. by creating a character in the first 20 minutes who is much more of a passive mm -hmm. figure, mm -hmm. you know, that when he start, as opposed to the, in the beginning of the play, which this is, he's already this way in terms of starting to be more aggressive. There is a, a bill to his aggression, which I think perhaps gives it some, hopefully gives it some momentum. And I think that it's important. I, I think you're exactly right, Gabriel, in, in, in that it allows... Charlie, Charlie's sort of trying on different ways of being in these few scenes. Uh, what is going to work best for him in terms of living in this world? And he's been a victim for a very long time, and here's where he starts acting otherwise. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's interesting, if you put these two scenes at the beginning of the film, he'd be a cock. I mean, <laughs> a jerk. Yeah. And instead, you sort of, through all the violence, you have sympathy for him, so that he's, even when he's sort of Iago-like in both of these scenes, he, uh, you, you, you root for him. Yeah. There are two ways to approach life as victim or as gallant fighter. And you must decide <laughs> if you're going to act or react. 
Deal your own cards or play with a stacked deck, because if you don't decide which way to play with life, it always plays with you. I mean, it's... One of the interesting things about these two actors is that the characters, you know, this is the one straight couple in the movie, and they're not dealt with in the most generous way possible. There aren't a lot of women in the movie, and, and, and I, f I just feel that they're able to get all the laughs that they need to get and still seem recognizably human and just a little sheltered. I mean, I thought he was just adorable, but a little bit too. <laughs> I think she's amazing. I thought she talked too much. It's a theatrically written scene, and I, I believe everything she said. I pushed until I got him, and here we are. One of the things that I really appreciate about the two of them, and, and, and Bill Sage in particular here, is that it would be so easy to check out of the scene. It would be so easy to make a comment about your character or just play into the negativity or the, the fear that people have or the, the brusqueness. And, and with Chuck here, um, he's so inside what's going on. He's making positive choices to be inside the scene even while he's not being the nicest guy. And that's not easy to do, and they do it effortlessly. Now this couple, you know, it's it's. So I have such respect for both of these guys. It's uh, Joe Denisi and Melinda Wade, and uh, they they're really really wonderful actors. And it's just really brave of them. You know, they they trusted us that we wouldn't take advantage of them, and they I, I just think create you know real characters up there while showing us you know their bodies, and, and uh, that's a big risk. What's interesting is like with, with Danny, you know, with the masturbation scene, for instance, it was, it, 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 it certainly wasn't fun. And I remember you asking me to just tell you what to do because I just wanted to roll the camera and, and, and uh, you needed, uh, you know, you, you, you wanted me to be a, a, a participant, which I think would take the onus off you. And, and I can understand that. As uncomfortable as you were directing me in doing it. That's what I wanted you to feel Message. while I was doing it. <laughs> That's what I wanted you to share in. <laughs> um, this sharing thing is actually, I think, at the, the crux of the director's job. You know, you, you want to let the actor feel, and perhaps in this instance I didn't, that you're there with him and or her, and that acting can be lonely. You're making your choices, but you want to make sure that your choices are within the world of the movie and fit into the world of the movie and and that you are not making a fool of yourself. You are, you are doing the right thing. And, and I was surprised at myself that sometimes I wasn't doing that right, that having been an actor, I was getting the technical stuff down that I thought I wouldn't be able to get at all. And I often, hopefully not that often, could not figure out a way to create a bridge for the actor into the world of the movie. Um, and and uh, I look forward to, to being wonderful all the time when it comes to that. I mean, it's terrible, but... The friends of friends? Yeah, why? Because I, I heard the same story like five years ago in Seattle. What happened to the girl, not the guy? Why are you being so negative? Just because it's not your story? I think this is... We an important section here tonight. in terms no, of the types of people that, well, it's, it's literal right here. So I can let the movie speak for itself. <laughs> so, Chuck, you don't think shit like that happens? Well, yeah, sure, but not the... <laughs> I mean, one of the things that the movie's playing with is the myths that we have about each other and the myths that we have about ourselves. And what straight culture has about the gay culture is all the way through this movie. A lot of the tales, as I said before, sort of relate to that. But also myths that gay people have about straight people, men have about women. And when bad things happen to you, sort of myths we have about ourselves in terms of uh, what we can do to get our life back. You know, that Charlie is, you know, as we discover along the way, is trying to sort of create an urban legend of his own. And I like what you've done, what you did here in the writing, in that they know this story from one side, which is them upstairs having fun in bed and assuming a certain thing about their downstairs neighbor, and Charlie gives him the other side of it, which is not as uh, easy to take. One thing that, that some people have said about the movie so, um, is, is that straight people and women aren't, aren't you know, particularly likable. I don't think anybody in the movie is seen through rose-tinted glasses. Yelping and moaning. There is this burden that 
serious films have, uh, particularly films that are representing um, a minority point of view, that they have to be politically correct. And this movie isn't. You have a, a lead character who does some reprehensible things. There aren't a lot of women, um, and the women that are there are not traditional heroines. I think that they're strong, though. I think that one of the things that folktales deal with is fear of the of minorities, of people at the margins, people at the outside, people who are other, and that are getting more power than they had before, so that you will have in these folk tales women who steal kidneys and the like. And I think that the kidney thief is actually a, a very, very strong character. A black man was disappointed with the movie because there weren't more black characters and that the men in the photo with the toothbrushes up their butts um, was not exactly something we should all be proud of. And I tried, when looking at the adaptation from the play, to broaden the cast of characters and broadened it a bit. Um, the cashier is, is perhaps a pathetic attempt. Um, but I think that he, he, he gets a little bit of his resentment out of that woman and the way she treats him. Um, but you can't be everything to everybody. I was pleased when our composer, who is an African-American, saw the movie. He said that he did not feel that the movie was racist at all. Um, you know, we, we were worried about those types of comments just because we want everybody to love us. And, and you can't get everybody to love you. So, uh, so we did our best and then tried to just be true to the story as it exists. Here again, Charlie has been rewarded for even worse behavior. Pretty much every time you see Dean, he's got something in his mouth, a cigarette or a drink. But to go back, we were talking about you know, Charlie's growth through the movie and his, his gaining control over a random world by misbehaving to a certain extent, sometimes standing up for himself. He's trying out different behaviors that will get him what he thinks he needs in order to move on. One of the changes that we made for the mat scene in the bar was, the first one, was placing the $50 down on the bar and, you know, and, and saying human needs mat, testing people. That was the way he started and now he's come much farther and is willing to follow this man in a way that he wasn't at the start and has the courage to sit down next to him. How are you doing this evening? Something I can get you? And is yeah. about to find the way hey, to, uh, to hey, bond with him, which is you seem like such a nice guy. being terrible to somebody else. Guys can bond over that. <laughs> I remember the feverishness. Where I'd, I'd written this uh, during our one rehearsal, which was a catastrophe. Do you remember uh, the one time we read through the entire script with everybody? At, my, at that uh, terrible apartment I was in. <laughs> Yes, so, which actually appears in this movie, <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll point that out. But the, what was great about that reading is was that it was a catastrophe, and everybody dealt with their scenes so seriously that, that it really helped when we got to the scenes because I was trying to prove to everybody that you needed to act as if this was the best time in your life until you could no longer possibly <laughs> convince yourself of it. I mean, that's, that's one of the greatest values of rehearsal, even though we had such a short one here, is not just to work on the scenes themselves. Because if you've cast it right, you're going to want to have sparks go when people make their discoveries in front of the camera. But for the actors to see, especially for people who only have one or two scenes, how they fit into the whole without you having to describe it, just by seeing the other actors and, and seeing and hearing and feeling the different tones they'll have a better sense of the context of their scenes. This is Kuder and Dorfmeister playing. Great well, music. Who the fuck does she think she is? You know, I mean, you fuck with me, I'm gonna fuck with you. You know, that's it. I don't care if it's a fucking mother. Of course, then she wants to go. Wait, 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 wait. So this is before or after you set the kitchen on fire? This is a reshoot while we were, again, while we were shooting because we were in this place for three days. It's Sam's first day. We shot it and we wanted to go back. And when he came in and auditioned, he had bangs. He's a nice kid from Virginia. And the first day, I think he was a little scared and he was still great. Um, but uh, we came back and shot. this is the master. This is from the first day. 
but the close-ups are all from the next day. He's a nice kid from Virginia. He's still kind of creepy looking. <laughs> And Dan, actually, you helped with, with a lot of this movie. And one of the things was I, I was up against people thinking that, that he was too young and that he didn't have enough experience. And they were all wrong. And Dan pretty much said if anybody else played the part, uh, he wasn't going to be nice to them. <laughs> well, we, I was going to do it. I mean, we had that, that day of auditions with people, and, uh, and he scared the shit out of me. And, and nobody else did. It was clear he was the best one. He's just great. I think he's great. Yeah. And what was, what was amazing about that audition was that it's uh, the swamp scene, which takes place both in the present and the past. And I did something that was really unfair, which has made him do both of them at the same time. And you would move forward on him when it was in the present. And he was, you know, in the passive position. And then he would move forward on you when it was in the past and during the bashing. And just do them in sequence. And he was not only amazing at both, but it was seamless and casual and effortless as is everything that he did in it. In a very generic Midtown office building. (laughs) Where he had the auditions. Remember that? It's just the most ridiculous place to audition for this movie. Well, it was our office. It was (laughs) (laughs) Stephanie, our producer's mother's office. (laughs) That's what we were doing. Uh, We had decided to make the movie and go with not all of our money. And uh, so so, so, uh, spared every dime we could. You know, I think that Sam, I mean, I don't think it's arguable the other way Sam has the hardest job in this movie which yes. is playing Dean I mean uh, people do great work in this movie but but that is the hardest part to play and make it in any way sympathetic and utterly believable oh yeah I have to call attention to Shane's work in that scene where, where basically a lot of the camera work once we had done what we needed to do to make sure we could make our days, we then would go back over a scene to try to do things that were more subjective from Charlie's point of view. And the scene when we were able to go back and reshoot this is cut but also shot so subjectively that it gets us you know, really inside you, which, which helps. And uh, Shane, I think, just did a great job with the camera. We shot that entire scene in maybe 15 minutes and used it. I mean, we had two takes on either side, and it, I just don't think it can be beat. This was her, this is first day, right? Yep. Of shooting, and uh, I had great respect for you before we shot it because of the script and, and from our conversations. But when, at the point when you decided that we would not do coverage on the scene is when uh, I fell in love with you as a director. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's it's you know they're they're they're. We're dealing with something where, again, it, I knew it was going to be very cutty, and I know there's going to be a lot of subjective work. Um, and this is really all, even though we cut away to Sam, this is I mean, we cut away to Josh, it's pretty much all the same take. Right. And, uh, um, you know, you just got to <laughs> trust you guys. And it makes sense story-wise. I mean, I, I'm, I act on a TV show now, and we do coverage on absolutely everything. And there is midsize and close-up and push-in on every single person. And this makes sense for the telling of the story, which is that these two guys are finally in the same shot together. Yes. And that, you know, we do a lot of cutting in at the bar because you're still trying to get him, and he's very much in his own world. Right. And by playing hard to get, you get him over there. And so the point is that you're able to contain him. My freedom. Right, yeah, freedom. Huh? Something else to add is uh, that uh, the scene on the TV that was playing in those flashes is the Ron soap opera. My problem is I have a very, uh, like, restless nature. You know, I don't even know what I want in this fucking life anymore. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I think to myself, I look around, you know, and I think, no, uh-uh, bullshit that you, them, any fucking body should have what What is that red thing in the back there? Where I am. So nice looking. <laughs> it's a light. <laughs> it's a Shane light to give it some atmosphere back there. That's good. Let's play some fucking. That's another. Morgue. There are lots of references to death here. Fucking morgue. Almost every time you refer to Chris in the Brett scene and any time after, has death attached to it, and it's one of those nice things where it, you know, it works as just talking about a dead relationship until you know. This is the beginning of Charlie getting Dean drunk or stoned without uh, without doing too much himself. Um, you hardly ever see me take a drag on the joint. I keep handing it back to him. And I think you edited that well, too. The way that you guys bond is interesting to me. Too big. Did you hear what they do with their pets? The movie never is explicit about whether Dean is a closet case if he's repressed, but there is a, a lot of sublimation in terms of 
what guys do right, with okay. each other that has intimacy without consciousness. And, yeah, you know, you. drinking together, he lights your cigarette, you share a joint, you're going to share a bottle share from that point on. Uh, mm -hmm. And we get pretty explicit well, you about do the that. Knives, she does the spoons, right? This was uh, an added scene for the reshoots, right? Because you wanted yes. to show more of uh, more of this relationship, and I think it was good. Yeah, I mean that when you look up in that window, what it reminds you of. I saw you on the bus today. Not me. Now, wherever I go in the city, there you are. Now, I see you. I talk to you. What do I say? In addition, it makes clearer. Um, this sense of everybody cast in the movie, all the potential love objects for you all have the same basic shape as Matt Kiesler. People, there's a good friend of mine actually believed when he saw the movie that Matt was in a lot of those shots <laughs> as those characters. Sam, Gabe, Bill Sage, they're all pretty much the same height. I mean, it, it was done on purpose that way. We were lucky that there were great actors who tended to look a lot alike. And yeah, that guy... The, uh, yeah, Paul Dawson, yeah. the vanishing man who is always in need of help. I mean, again, there, are, you know, the idea that is understandable now that you've seen the movie of, of hey, on. one of the things that's driving Charlie, it's in addition to trying to get something. Chris back, is guilt over not protecting him, not saving him. And this man who keeps appearing, he's appeared twice before, bloodied, looking for help, and now seems to be more of a malevolent spirit, sort of excited that Charlie's on his way to get what he should have. So many of Charlie's actions can be seen as varied responses to grief. The opening section of the movie is complete stasis. He's shell-shocked and can't move. That's one response, an early response usually. Um, that is now replaced by a desire for revenge, of taking back what was taken from him. That's the longest section. I love the look of this. I love uh, Super 16 and uh, these new stocks where you can use almost just available light. It's so clear and vital. I love this edit here from the west end of Christopher Street to the boat basin on 79th Street. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a New York state of mind. You know, I think it's funny is that none of the reviewers, and you know a fair number of them, had been to the piers and uh, done whatever, made any comment about, that's not where the guys go. Yeah, this place, um, it, we were going to shoot, it. A, the piers, the way they used to be, no longer exist. And it was also, we went down to one of the remaining piers, and we lasted for maybe 20 seconds. It was freezing. <laughs> one of the things we haven't talked about is that this was shot in December, and we were really lucky. David Metwico, the costume designer in the background there. Yeah, it's actually his fourth appearance. He is the waiter <laughs> right. with the cake in the, the bar scene. He is the person walking by you during your Saturday Night Fever shot. And the drag queen on the street. Yeah, who's not in the movie anymore. <laughs> but he'll be, I guess, all editor for the deleted scenes now. But Philippe Dunham, who was one of the production managers and a first AD, knew of this place when we couldn't be, you know, uncovered. A lot of people that I know actually now think that this is a pickup place. And uh, a lot of New Yorkers don't even know that this place exists. They drive it, which by is it amazing. I know that. It's completely amazing. And there's a, but although people will more now because in the summers there's a, there's sort of a, a beer garden down there. Yeah. One of the things that Sam does, which I think is remarkable, is that Dean, who seems to be the type of guy who wouldn't be a talker, actually never shuts up. <laughs> um, and part of it is out of need, and, and part of it is to, you know, for us to be able to deal with a type of acceptable homophobic language and, and the sort of the scientific way that these guys can talk in terms of, you know, their little rules of the way the world works. They fucking see. You know, they ride the train like everybody else. You know, they see men and they see women together. The music behind this is by Charles Mingus. You're told when you're making a movie not to fall in love with your temp tracks. And because I knew I was going to, I had written the last draft of the script to particular music. And so when we got a music supervisor, when we finished shooting, we had a year to line stuff up and just wear down the patients. Uh, or actually just hope that people would, you know, be worn down by our persistence. And the Mingus estate was great to us. And I think we're the first movie, or at least one of the only movies that have been allowed to use this music. It's just perfect. And the way it blends with the sound design, the fact that uh, not only added sounds, but the sounds of the highway on the dialogue tracks above. This is right below the West Side Highway. Just fits in perfectly. 
It's a Mingus music played on Harry Parch glass instruments. Let me tell you something. They enjoy the abuse. You know that? And they're like they're like the spooks. I mean, it's like it's like oh you. Uh, there's a lot of uh, shadow play in this, and this scene and that's coming up. The shot that's coming up now is is where the uh, the movie really uses it. I think this sh this sequence was lit beautifully by Shane. Uh, and the steady cam is by a man named Sergey Franklin, who did a great job. Come on, let's go outside. <laughs> Come on. Let's walk outside. Shh. Oh, yeah, like when the moment's yeah. right. Right. When the moment's right. Oh, don't go away, man, baby. <laughs> this sequence is interesting because one of the things that happens is that the characters are consistently demonizing other people, people who are other to them. And while gay men are, are demonized by Dean, Charlie's also built a vision of Dean in his head. And what Dean reveals about his family here sort of complicates things a bit. And I think you do that great. I think that's right. I think this takes Charlie by surprise that he's going to actually feel something for this guy. And it allowed us, having the room to do that, not only add some dimension to this, but also helps us with the MacGuffin in terms of, you know, people who haven't caught on yet. And a lot of people watching the movie haven't. Even when Dean has been spouting this stuff, a lot of people believe that Charlie's just in love with the wrong guy. And this sequence here over the bottle and warming up to him over what he's revealed sort of allows the MacGuffin to continue on for people who still want to believe it. And you could take it one of two ways, or one of a number of ways, but Charlie could be uh, actually having some sympathy, some feelings for, uh, for Dean or testing him. This is Jerry Bamman. Christ, that's a fucking look. The only man in America to have played both uh, Richard hey. Nixon and uh, Leather Queen. <laughs> Again, I love the shadows here. It's uh, sort of the talking oh, helmet <laughs> over there. Hey. The talking cap. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> want to take a walk? Well, I don't go nowhere without my butt. Though. A lot of the movie's about control. The connection with folktales to a large extent is all urban legends are about, you know, you think your life is on the right track and, you know, that you're in control of your own life and it's taken away from you. And Charlie has had control over his life taken away from him, both when he's fallen so completely in love with Chris and when that love's been taken away from him. And now Charlie finally has Dean and got him and feels in control and there's a series of things that the world starts taking control away again in terms of the appearance of this man. get a sense of what Dean uh, what so, Dean does right in this shot coming up here uh, I can think of a few things there we go so now Charlie's in a spot how's he going to stop this without you know revealing himself my butt here, are you? hey Charlie come on over here and tell me what your butt likes And he's helped by the appearance of the couple from the window. Again, almost everybody appears twice. Hey. Holy shit, I know you. I'm a high school biology teacher. Look at you. I know it's my Don't high school know. chemistry teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Chris Bradley, the man who was just the dick, the man in the goatee, actually played Ron Gable's part in the play. Was wonderful and was really generous in, in coming back and doing this. We had... A lot of the characters are much younger in the movie, and that was the major reason, because Chris had been great in the play. Hey, you get a car? Yeah, if I can find it. So, plot-wise now, we're to a certain extent at the beginning of the movie, when Charlie was driving and saying Hearing Good Stories Lately is about to be repeated uh, in this car, and to a certain extent, now that he's finally in control and has Dean where we want him, the movie is under control. The, the way that the beginning works in terms of how fragmented it is and not knowing much about Charlie, the audience is to the movie as 
Charlie is to the world, not in control. And now that he has control, the movie sort of starts to reveal itself and lets the audience know, if they haven't guessed so far, what the plot is, what Charlie wants, what happened to him. What point do people tell you that they finally figured out what's up? It's remarkable. It changes most people don't know until not even here, but the swamp scene when you say it. Until they're dependent on the road and the ride that people are on in the beginning, it's built out of such fragments and sort of flows um, emotionally that people are just on the ride when the kidney story happens and we discover that it's not real, it's not a B-plot with these two other people, it's a folktale, and then she appears in your life, all bets are off, and people stop, often people stop trying to figure out what's real and what isn't in the way that folktales are. How are you liking it here? It's fine. It's a nice place, very white, like you. A vision. Charlie, hey, I've been good. I've stayed away. Oh, welcome, Wagon. This is nice. It's four o'clock in the morning, and you're looking a little gay. The return so of the extra the hour, hour and what Charlie's done with it. Thanks. So it's not as late as And uh, the time, what you'll discover when the scene is over is that the, this is the hour you get back. That just when the movie seems to be under control, for the first time it actually doesn't show a scene all in one. We've been in a car and now we move ahead to the white room and then back to this scene. Um, we're out of time a bit. And so while when the beginning of this car scene, you realize that the entire movie could actually have been a flashback while Charlie is about to tell the story, we also now have a future to this scene. So it keeps you off kilter. You're taking me home, right? Wait, you know where the fuck I live? Hey, don't worry, buddy. A line that Charlie has said before. I've got everything under control. I can drive. You, know? you hear any good stories lately? I don't feel. Is that it now? Let me see if I. I, mean, I think a lot of people say this, and I think that it's it's true. Uh, the movie. Well, I got a good one. Picks up an enormous amount of momentum. This one really the moment I that, swear. that the another appears example on screen. Of the and, uh, I mean, a lot is that the plot Just is finally when you're safe. A lot is due to a uh, certain menace of just saying. Place. Yeah. And it's interesting because a lot of people prefer the first half to the second half, and other people prefer the second half to the first half. It's, it's sort of left brain, right brain people. You know, the movie is, the first half of the movie is constructed more along, you know, thematic lines, and the second half has a plot. And now we're getting there. We're in New Jersey. <laughs> and just when we're getting there, and we're in a present where the plot is taking over, Charlie's turning it into a photo in this story. out in the big city with his buddies, lurking around a certain kind of urban nightlife. You know the kind. Charlie, Listen, I'm not one night this guy... I think Carol did an amazing job here at production Thank design. You. This is an office. And when she arrived in the morning, it was filled with rubble. And you guys did an amazing job, which is that the man who ran that office was there the entire time, still making all of his office phone calls. <laughs> During takes. There's a take that's coming up that... I so loved what you did that we just did everything we could to take it out or just used a different take for certain words to put over because I refused to let him dictate what takes we were going to use. So he guzzles and guzzles and he wakes up in a field. It is a testament to how much I trusted you as a director that in the shot that just happened in the weight room, uh, I had to take a little walk around the apartment behind the screen and I said, John, why am I doing that? You just, cause just walk around, just walk around the screen. I said, fine, that's fine. I thought the reason that you're going to say you trusted me is that you allowed yourself to urinate on screen. That's I was so proud of you. I did actually urinate on cue. Yeah, that's, not many people can do that. <laughs> I can do that. And this sequence was shot really beautifully. The fog and the light. Um, we had one night to do what normally would be a week or two for for a regular movie, a movie that actually had time to shoot. You guys did in a night with a couple of inserts a number of days, in one case months later, because it was so cold that the blood, which is about to run at the end of the scene, wouldn't run. But the nice thing about it being so cold is that we get great vapor there. I know it's been five months, but shit. Oh, I'm your bud, man. What the fuck you're talking about? Don't you? Really? No. This sequence, uh, we were really fortunate that we had a lot of time <laughs> to edit the movie, in part because there was so little money that when an editor had to go off and do a job, I was able to 
ask a friend to help out and just watch the movie for a while. And then when Randy was available, work with him for a while. And this sequence took probably a month and a half to edit. We actually went back and edited each scene unto itself, the whole swamp scene on its own, the white room scene on its own, so that they, we would understand the rhythms of, of, of the scene itself and then intercut them. It was important with all the editing that was happening that it be rooted in, in Charlie's emotion rather than this will be neat. And, uh, you know, the degree to which we were successful is completely subjective. Yeah, you did kind of an amazing thing before that swamp scene, uh, which is that Sam and I were running through it and part of it wasn't making a lot of sense to us and it seemed a little long. And you sat down for 10 minutes uh, in the trailer and rewrote it. Well, you know, I mean, that's, that's the job. And what's great is both of you share a... Every actor in this movie, what's interesting is that you, you, let, you let us come to you. You know, every, it's, they're not big, broad performances, even when sometimes, as in The Neighbors Upstairs, the, the characters are, are, are fairly broadly drawn. Everybody's a type. You know, they're the bartender, the yuppie, to a certain extent, and then they're humanized as it goes along, you know, the, the urban legend aspect of the movie. And, you know, when you guys, because, you know, you trust yourselves when you would say that something wasn't working, you know, I would try to fight for a little bit if it was something that I did believe was working, or there's something when you put a script together that, you know, this script took two and a half years for the screenplay. It went through eight drafts. And there's some stuff that you hope will work once you get it up on its feet that may be not working so well. And when somebody says it's not working great for me, you go, okay, somebody caught me. And uh, here there was so much weight. The story is taking over. We're finding out what happened in the past. There's some thematic stuff going on. Whether, you know, Dean is believable as giving into this. We discover his pathology in terms of that he's turned on. There were, you know, the issue of Charlie um, having him pull down his pants was very loaded. So when you had issues, it was just going in there and figuring out how to make it work. I mean, this, this movie is, to a certain extent, built around you. And any time that you had a question, it had to be taken seriously. And this movie, the feel of it is the way the world has felt to me when my life's been taken out of control. When you do that, you then shoot it. And when actors have, you know, you've cast these people, and you have to assume you've cast them for a reason. And if they have questions, you, you have to listen to it. And the movie's remade that way. And you then finish shooting and you watch the movie and you watch it over and over again and you can't hold on to the way you thought it was going to work. You deal with the natural rhythms of your performance and his performance and the movie itself and it, it makes its demands. And you made it so easy to put this together because we're riding your emotion. You know, the erection we should talk about because that was something that had a lot of controversy when people read the script. I would draw pictures and tell people how little was being seen and how quickly we were going over this, but it was important to me that we see the pathology of him, that he is turned on by being on the receiving end as much as being on the other side because of, I think, a number of reasons uh, that I, I leave up to you, but clearly, you know, something that happened in his past, I think, with his dad. Why don't you lick my tit? What? Lick my tit, you <laughs> faggot! <laughs> you like that? <laughs> Let's try a little lower. This is sort of, I think there's an amazing thing happening here in the editing, which is that there are three there stories go. that are about oh. to climax, and you keep... It's as al almost as if there's not enough time for all of them to happen, <laughs> but yet you keep delaying the climax in each of them. The the bottle shot in particular is repeated three times, and right. each time it gets a little close. <coughs> Excuse me, a little closer. But uh, one of the things that I like about the clips in the white room at this stage that are so quiet is that there is a palpable sense of grief in them, of Charlie's woeful inadequacies that he feels in terms of having not been able to rise to the occasion and be a man and be a protector. The editing style and the editing rhythms of the movie are now, I feel, and, and Randy is primarily responsible for this, um, we're inside both of these guys, um, that, that there's an emotional shift happening where the, the emotion that's going on cannot be contained anymore. And Charlie is getting better and better at containing his, but Dean now has taken on that lack of control. The movie's having an epileptic fit. Each plot line is, is, as we're getting closer, the movie sort of can't take the tension and keeps exploding. Love that girl. 
you know, one of the things that's happening here is that Charlie was doing this to a certain extent to have his release when actually control's taken away from them and Dean has it. I mean, that phase. I mean, he sort of has the innocence that Charlie was hoping to be able to regain. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> well, the reason why it was easier when we were talking is that it's hard to watch it. Chris, stop it! Stop it! Chris, no! Stop it! Sam did that epileptic fit a number of times that night, and then again on two separate locations in the movies. Isn't that right? Yeah. We, uh, the last day of shooting, which is on the desolate street, this location, where the bashing was, because we finally, even though we hadn't used up all our time, and this sequence goes on for 10 pages. Right. That's on Gay Street, right? I mean, just that shop before that, was yeah. straw put down on, on the center of Gay Street. Yeah. That is so good in that in the bashing scene, and one of the things that amazes me is that he did a play that night. We started it. He then we took a dinner break, and he went away and did the play. We shot around him, and then he came back. And he was still amazing. We have this picture of him that while we're setting up the bashing around him, he is asleep in the middle of the street. There was urine in the middle of the street. And he's on a mat right on top of it. Um, <laughs> he was just so exhausted. Yeah, I think that's uh, emblematic of how he's feeling. He was, he was doing a play that was not doing very well. <laughs> he probably felt he had to sleep at all. <laughs> now, the nice thing about this section is that the audience discovers that we're trying to eat our cake and have it too. That we've seen Charlie do unto Dean what he did unto Chris. What and we discover do? that he wishes he had done that because he feels that that would make him a man, but... He didn't, and the audience get to experience their excitement if they like the fact that he does that, and then their horror often, which is what they tell me, that they had rooted for Charlie to do it, but now they're grateful that he didn't. Um, also, in the original shoot, Dean doesn't slit Char Chris's throat, but makes him go down on the broken bottle, and that's what we assume kills him. But it looked awful. Another reprise of uh, We Were on Top, so much of the movie, every scene is about somebody trying to have power over another person. And folk tales in the same way. And I just think, you were amazing in every shot of this, but this is a shot I was talking about before where there's one word that I have taped over here because, right here when you have your hand up, because the man whose office this was is talking. <laughs> and that you could hold your focus. I think part of what this movie is about is different definitions of what it is to be a man and needing to be in control and that Charlie feels that in order to get his life back he has to get biblical and do what was done to him and that in reality he actually used that knife and put it in his mouth to stop him from hurting himself tells much more about who Charlie really is he did steal his car after all <laughs> ease he is with you physically when you know this was his second day of shooting um you know that you you really helped us and that you were there every day and and because i had so little time to talk to anybody and could never leave the set you really sort of co-hosted this movie and i think that it helped put everybody at ease both with the difficult scenes and i mean every scene's difficult it's either sexual or it's intimate i mean it's intimate when it's sexual but intimate just emotionally here and that's hard and, and i think that you know, you made that happen. Well, I don't know. It's hard. I, 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 I think that uh, it's what actors want to do is play scenes that A, make sense, and B, allow them to, you know, do something interesting. And it's much harder to play a scene that's not about anything. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. I mean, that's much harder. You come you come home from a day like that, and you're much more exhausted than a, than a day <laughs> like this. 
Uh, th- one thing about Matt that I want to say, which is, that I, I don't know if it was conscious on his part or not, but there's a, such a simplicity to his performance, and I think it allows people, uh, because there is something of him uh, that's a fantasy in this, whether he, this scene's really happening or not, uh, this is left up to people to decide, but it allows people to put a lot onto him, and for someone that doesn't appear that much in the movie, I think you get a great sense of who he is, but a lot of that's provided by people watching, I think. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things that some audience members have talked about is the fact that they wanted to know more about your relationship with him and his character. And unfortunately, you know, that's a different movie. We see people feel that your scenes with him are sort of idealized, and to a certain extent, that's the point. But you do, you don't, you don't mourn the bad stuff. Right. Now, that's a telltale shot right there. There are a lot of people who, at that point, if they've had a question about... Uh, yeah. Uh, now, that's Carol's idea, the idea that the, the quilt is floating above. Right, and the script was on the wall, is that right? Yeah, it's hanging on the wall. She's brilliant, and, and it's a great idea. Oh, God, I'm sorry. Hold on. There are a lot of Charlie sort of looking through the looking glass in this movie, and this is the last one. But there we go. Now we sort of understand why there's Milo on the floor. <laughs> also, the direction at this point was Dan looking the Mylar. <laughs> and you didn't want to. Sorry, Charlie. <laughs> it's okay. One of the things that's gone by here that I should call attention to because it's come up for people is in the Ron scene, for instance, some people have felt that it's a fight between two tops. It really isn't that. You were just taking him on where his phobia was. We explain that, I think, a bit in terms of the the fact that clearly in your flashback with Matt in bed, where you say, didn't we just do that? And he says, uh, I go over, you go under. And here, again, where you say, I want this out of me, I want you in me. Like a lot of the movie, there is sort of a sexual reference and a figurative reference at the same time. This is an if you didn't know before, you now know by reading this poster that he's dead. God, I'm glad you didn't call this movie Lover's Lane. As you were thinking. <laughs> I never thought of calling the movie Lover's Lane. That's not true. <laughs> One thing that you're not seeing in the movie that was cut was Charlie in the beginning when he's on the street, which is this street, and you see that lamppost in the corner. A father and son go by, and the father picks his son up, and the son is reading the poster. And the father says, you can read, and the little boy goes, Lover's Lane. And you think it's Lover's Lane, because you see the couple walking down, holding hands. There's a lot of holding hands in the movie, and Charlie reaching out for other people. And the shot that we have often of the two of them holding hands and Chris pulling away, because that's what gets Dean onto them. But then later on, a couple come by while Charlie's on the floor and look at the sun, and she goes, oh, honey, lover slain. And it was a nice play on words that uh, I was proud of, but we don't need. <laughs> Just, um, being too clever by half is a, a definite sin. But this is a clever shot, and it works. I think it works beautifully. And that that's me there, and then that's me on the other side. Yeah. But uh, I think it works just right. It's interesting when you cut this stuff, uh, how important a few frames are. Uh, Ed Marks did the primary cutting on this section, and, and, and just the pause that Charlie takes before he bends down into this um, affects me. And it's just a couple of frames. It's a little bit of slow motion there. Um, but Charlie has to go through this. He has to see Chris die in order to move on. We have to see it so we know. <laughs> This is a magical street. It's called Gay Street, and it's where Waverly, which you see behind him, meets Waverly, which is in front of him, which we'll see soon. Waverly sort of exists in two places down there on the street. The people who lived on the street didn't love us. But the New York Film Commission was amazing to us. We shot in a lot of hot spot areas, meaning areas that are so overshot that you're not allowed to use it. But we sent them the script, and they were great to us. So you see here now that actually the street that you thought was a dead end continues on. And that looking up, which Charlie does a lot in this movie, and where we have a lot of those shots that look down, I think we now know who.
who he's been dealing with. And now there's a lot of getting up. Charlie just got up out of frame, and now Bill getting up and moving on. And as Dan said before, this is a reshoot. Um, and Lothair is so amazing that he was told for the reshoot that we were using his arm for the elevator shot, a reshoot of the elevator shot, which is no longer in the movie. We told him no, we were redoing his final scene, and he said, oh, I haven't looked at it, can you just give me 10 minutes? And this was, uh, and he came up with this. It's just At the same time, when in between shots, he's, he's saying, I, can, I bought that fucking apartment in Soho, I can't pay for it, uh, what am I going to do? $800,000. <laughs> you know, just uh, switches on and off. He's, he's the best. Yeah. I'm going to go inside. Uh, all right, right. People have asked us, why is he crying? Is that necessary? A, there's a logical reason he's been robbed, but the sense of the, the movie just getting it all out and you know, the other characters, there's a lot of transference going on, which is a highfalutin word. But uh, it was interesting. We did a lot of test screenings where I would stand in front of uh, our local art house, Multiplex, and stand in front of Guinevere to have women come see the movie and lock, stock, and two smoking barrels to see the sort of indie action group and trick for the gay audience. And we'd put people together and they would talk about it and they'd say, I love it, blah, 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 but I didn't need to see Charlie go down the street one last time. And the person next to them would say, no, I needed that. I just didn't need to see the homeless man scene after that. And then somebody would say, no, I needed that. I need, but I didn't need the, the, the bed scene. And the next person saying, no, I needed that because the movie doesn't exist. That the movie starts with him in bed and ends with him in bed and it's his fantasy of what he should do to get out of this. And I loved that. This is a movie where because it's so chock-a-block. It's a complicated emotion that is dealt with, I think, you know, in a complicated fashion. For some people, that might not lead to complexity, but for us, it felt right. And those scenes lead to where I think the movie's headed, which is, it's not simple. I mean, Charlie, in this position, sort of at the median of that bed and hugging that pillow, it's not over. His loss doesn't have a, a bow at the end of it right here because he has either committed revenge or because he has turned the other cheek or committed an act of kindness with Bill, though that helps. It's allowing the world into him, knowing that he cannot control. He did not have control over what happened to him. He has no control over what's going to happen to him. Um, it's a day-by-day -day affair. And it gets a little better every day if you try to hold on to what was good without holding on too strongly uh, and let in as much good as possible that's new and let out as much of what is bad, but not necessarily through violence. The, the thing that happened to me when I was young, which was an act of violence, that's the way I got through it. I had dreams of... of being the man and, and, and going out there and, and doing the Rambo thing and, and let that go. And, uh, and not every day goes by anymore where I think about that. It just recedes. Now, as these credits go by, um, the biggest thank you that needs to be made is, is to uh, my producing partners who made this movie happen and allowed me to make the movie that, uh, that we all wanted to make. And primarily those thanks go to Stephanie Golden, who was with me every day, um, being the best producer you can hope for, where she understood the movie creatively and was completely supportive in a constructive fashion, not letting me go do everything I wanted to do. But uh, we sort of grew up together on this. I'd never been behind a camera except for a couple of hours before, and she had never produced anything. And, and uh, it was a great partnership. And, um, and I cannot say enough about her. Uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you. And Todd Harris as well uh, was there from the beginning and, uh, and gave us legitimacy and his support, um, making, I think, much less money than he's ever made in his life, which is so far zero, uh, as most of us have. Um, and the editors, uh, the patience that they had. It was so much fun to work with them. And uh, it lasted for a very long time so that the movie could discover itself in a better fashion. And thank you and, and everybody who has been so supportive in terms of the web writing to me and coming up to me. People who you know have seen the movie countless times. The last screening I was at, there were a number of people who were there for uh, three times, uh, four times, and, and one person who was there for the fifth time. And that means the world. Um, 
you know, it's, it's one thing to say I made the movie I wanted to make. That's a very good thing. But it's another to know that people actually got it and received it in the, in the manner that you hoped that they would. We were blessed with audience response and, and, and critics as well who were very kind, though I wasn't always thrilled that they gave away everything. But the movie was designed like a folktale where you can appreciate it both knowing nothing and also appreciate it if you do know it. And we went through in the writing stage and in the editing stage to try to make it as complete an experience, but a different experience depending upon what you know. And hopefully you won't feel, uh, if you see the movie a second time or a third time, that you've been manipulated or lied to in terms of the flow of information. Um, but it's been great to talk to people uh, who, who've, who've responded to the movie. Even people who have disagreements with some of it. It's been very, very fertile and full and uh, a blast. So thank you. And, uh, and, and thanks as well to Danny. Most of this movie is, is a tribute to, to his talent. And thanks to Dolby Digital, because um, the movie sounds completely different when uh, it's in digital. You can just close your eyes and just listen and have a complete experience. And it can be different from the visual experience, which is a good thing.